Uh, it is getting ready for the Medallia Superbike, first of two races here, and a mega championship on the way. The racing in this category this year has been absolutely terrific, and the field starting to build up on the uh, the false grid, if you will, and everybody getting ready to go. There you can see Josh Hayes has made it on and is at his bike. So we are ready to go, and that means it's time for a brief opening ceremonies and something very special with that. It is my absolute pleasure for the national anthem to please ask everybody to rise and remove your cover as Pastor Mark and his wife Don Miracle give us the national anthem. And today we would like to dedicate uh, this national anthem to Scott Bridey and his whole family. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. As always, absolutely stunning job that Mark and Don do uh, on our national anthem. Very, very special stuff indeed. All right, Roger, let's look ahead quickly uh, to what's going to unfold here. Cameron Bobier on pole. He's a bit back of Jake in the points. Needs to get something done here. Jake starts third. But how about Escalani and Brandon Posh right up in the mix? This one's going to be interesting. Yeah, this is going to be good. Cam Bobe, you know, they don't want him to get out early and get in his rhythm because he has showed some really good pace. But Brandon Posh qualifying fifth, that's a great qualifying for him. His second full weekend on, on the Superbike, and he's going to put himself right there, right in the mix with the big boys. So it's going to be a good learning experience for him. And you just have a feeling maybe that P.J. Jacobson could be a significant factor in this race on the team. Tightler Cycle BMW. Well, it's all about to unfold here at Brainerd International Raceway. Medallia Superbikes coming at you with that. Let's turn it over to Greg White and Jason Pridmore for the call. With the halfway point of the season behind us, we begin the final drive towards the number one plate. Defending champion Gagne has a firm grasp on the trophy, but Minnesota hasn't been his best track. Gagne is down! Gagne is down on the exit of turn number two. Will Gagne extend his lead or will Bobier and the rest start to even the playing field? Oh man, Bobier just put together a sparkling third sector. It's time to find out right now. It's time for the Moto America AMA FIM North American Road Race Championship, our sixth round for 2023. This round is Moto America Superbikes at Brainerd from right here in Minnesota from the famed Brainerd International Raceway Medallia Superbike race number one is coming up. Qualifying is done, practice is over, and it's time to put these motorcycles on the track and get after it. 
as we have a star-studded field of racers. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the broadcast. I'm Greg White, standing alongside two-time champ Jason Pridmore. Now, Jason, while we were away after WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca, the biggest news in Medallia Superbike has to be the fact that Cameron Peterson is not going to be racing the rest of the season. Yeah, it's been a tumultuous year for him, unfortunately, and it's just been riddled with a little bit of bad luck. Both in races, we've seen bikes break and testing. He's had a couple slide-offs, had a big one, uh, obviously, at testing in Barber, and that was really the one that I think undid him with the wrist injury that he has, and uh, we're all bummed to not have Cameron here. Yeah, for Cameron Peterson, he's been a race winner in Medallia Superbike over the years, and he was really excited to get his opportunity last year to race for the Fresh and Lean Progressive Yamaha team. And Jason, tons of skill and tons of heart. Yeah, no question about it. This guy, everybody loves Cam Peterson, and uh, we want nothing but the best for him, as you can see him winning at Barber, one of his three career Mo uh, Moto America Superbike wins. Uh, this guy's got a lot of heart, a lot of fight, but it just came a time where he just had to get this this wrist injury fixed. And uh, so he's not going to be with us for the rest of the year, unfortunately, although I hope we're going to get to see him at the track. His statement, unfortunately, this is not news I want to give everyone, but it's time for me to get this wrist work on. I tried to fight through the pain and get to the end of the season with some decent results, but it's at this point now that there's pain. It's affecting my riding results and in everyday life. I can't thank the team enough for being so understanding, but I know now after the surgery, uh, I'm going to be able to come back stronger and do my job, and that is to win races. I'll be back stronger than ever. Now, Jason, of course, with this, this is very interesting because obviously we know that he has a, a contract up at the end of the season. So what do you think it was for him to step away from the sport right now? Well, I think he's got a lot of confidence in the team. The team is obviously backing him. Um, I can't think of anybody better to put him, put on that bike right now. They've got this guy on the bike this weekend, but uh, as you see, Josh Hayes here, and uh, with 61 career wins, this was the guy that they needed to put on the bike. So for Josh Hayes, fast company with Cameron Bobier right there, nipping at his heels in terms of all-time wins. But look how many wins are in this Medallia Superbike field. Let's get right down to Hannah, who has Josh Hayes. Hi, Hannah. Coming fresh off a Super Sport win, Josh Hayes has changed motorcycles. But Josh, I want to ask you, how do you change your mindset to go from one motorcycle to the other? I don't know. <laughs> you have any ideas? <laughs> it's funny. Uh, no, I got out on this thing, you know, for a lot for 10 years of my career I did it this way where I rode two bikes and uh, so on the warm-up lap everything you know you you listen to the engine you know when to shift gears and and uh, you know it is a bit different than the other bike and so it's just a matter of remembering brake markers if I do that then everything else falls into place pretty good so uh, the big thing on this bike I think is after just doing 16 and now turn around doing 18 laps back to back will be to try to find some rhythm and keep my intensity and you know not not grip the bars and feel like this on the super bike and so if I can kind of find a smooth rhythm this morning I was able to roll around at a pretty decent pace and so I mean it sounds silly to say maybe the second half will be kind of my half you know I got to figure out a few things in the beginning and uh, yeah I'm looking forward to it. Best of luck out there Josh Hayes certainly enjoying being back on a super bike. Yeah, but Jay, you know, this isn't olden times where everybody's racing two classes, but he's doing it. Yeah, what I want you to pay attention to here is uh, on the Superbike, he's, you can see he sits in the bike a little bit more than he does on the R6. You also see it is the inside left foot is going to be a little bit different position. But the thing I want you to pay attention to more than anything here is the transition from this left to the right on the Superbike. That body's going to get transitioned a little bit quicker. This is the same place on the track, turns four and five. He's already starting to get that bike transitioned. And you can see on the Superbike, things are just happening a little bit quicker. The front end's coming up up off the ground he's got some electronics to to help him through and on the 600 talking with him he basically is just wringing the neck out of that thing and uh, i think being able to ride both bikes on a weekend you can see the posture and everything is is essentially exactly the same he's got a very classic kind of riding style in the sense that there's not a lot of extra movements i remember a time when josh hayes would hardly even get off a motorcycle at all so those are the differences that you'll see and uh you know he's proven successful on the 600 let's see what he can do on superbike well, he's got to contend with the rest of this field and right here at Brainerd International Raceway. Jason, tell us a little bit about this track. <laughs> it's been around a long time, Greg, but the front straight here uh, that they used to have is not like what it used to be. So you can see that line there right before turn one, fast turns one and two here, uh, upwards 150 mile, 160 mile an hour into turn two. Hard braking for turn three. You heard him talking about those braking markers are gonna be key all the way through four, five, six uh, into the new section, uh, new to us two years ago. Uh, that run back to the flag, turn 13 is going to be key. We've seen a lot of mistakes there. Go under the bridge, turn right, and you hope that you're the first one to that checkered flag. All right. Well, we are just four minutes away from a race start. 
This guy right here, Corey Alexander, hoping to pay back his team for that incident from yesterday. That was a total yard sale. What is he going to have for us today? All right, as we are closing in on the start here, one of the things we wanted to talk about is uh, we get an update on who's running what tires. For this event, for this track, Dunlop brings soft tires, but here they brought the ultra soft F-Zero tire, and he said some riders just like the feel they gave it. Jake Gagne, Escalani, Bobby Fong, Posh, and Hayes all opted to run that super soft tire instead of the F3. Yeah, and, and every rider is going to be be different. It's just like <clears throat> what gives you the feel in your hands, right? Yeah. So you know, we've heard a lot of riders talking about chatter this weekend, and, and one tire for some riders, it might take away the, the chatter and where you can feel the front end. And, and then also, you know, tire wear is not really a, a big problem here. But if it was, the softer tire would probably be better early in the front. And, and not as good as the, at the end, but it's all about those fast turns one and two. What gives you the confidence to go to go in there and, and also braking stability. Some guys like the front to move around a little bit on the brakes and other guys don't want to feel that tire. It can You can kind of feel it squish a little bit and uh, you get the, the little stiffer option that kind of takes it away. But all, all in all, it's all about what gives you the confidence to trail brake in these corners the best. So to get really technical, you're saying squish is okay, squirm not so much. Yeah. Well, each rider wants something, wants a different feel, so that's <laughs> what you got to figure out. Well, it's going to be a fascinating race, and we're talking about it into the second half of the season now. Points really start to become an issue, and for Cameron Bobier, he's got to convert. And he has to win some races, and he's got some points to make up. It's going to be tough. Jake Gagne is – Jake's in a really tough spot. You know, does he – not take the chance. Bobier wins a lot of races and really closes the gap. Or does he chase Cam down, take a chance of crashing? So he's in a really tough spot. I think if the win's there, he's going to go for it. But I don't think he's going to do anything to just give Cam a bunch of points. Right. Uh, yeah, exactly. I think he's going to be uh, a little bit cautious here. And as I said, uh, P.J. Jacobson, uh, that bike just looks really stable. And he's got some serious speed in it as well. And those two M4X star Suzuki's, well, it's going to be a good one, that's for sure. And it is about to set sail here at Brainerd International Raceway. Medallia Superbikes coming up. Medallia Superbike coverage is brought to you by Medallia, the pioneer in customer and employee experience. By Dunlop, the official tire of the Moto America Championship Series. And by Geico Motorcycle. Visit Geico.com to see how easy covering your ride can be. Back at Brainerd International Raceway, Medallia Superbike race number one, getting ready to get underway. As riders on the warm-up laps, let's get to the starting grid. Jason Pridmore, take a look at this because it's your boy Bobier on the It is. The P.J. Jacobson, tremendous effort from him and Gagne. Skultz, how about a shout-out for Brandon Posh, seven tenths down. Richie Escalante, Posh and only his second weekend on the Superbike, by the way. Heron Hayes, Fong, Gillum, Yates, and Corey Alexander. The team had to rebuild that bike. They were up late last night, Greg, building a new bike. Flinders, Meast, Nolan Lampkin, De Silva, Schmatter, and Ryan Burke. And then right just at the back there, we got Zach Schumacher and Manny Segura. 18 laps scheduled for Medallia Superbike race number one. I mentioned Josh Hayes doing double duty. He literally just got off a super sport machine and jumps right onto this Yamaha R1. Filling in for Cameron Peterson, but all eyes are on Bobier. This battle for the championship with PJ Jacobson mixed in there on the front row. This could get really interesting, Jay, because if you look at the point spread between Cameron Bobier and Jake Gagne, as well as Josh Heron right there, you're only talking 34 between Gagne and Bobier and 39 between Gagne and Heron. And this isn't like I can finish second the rest of the year right. and win this championship. And I think here, you got to remember, the right side of the track where Bobier is starting, that is not where people ride all the, 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 at all. So I think that Gagne actually has a pretty good spot here on the outside where people have been riding. The track's going to be cleaner. Medallia Superbike race number one is a go. Bobier gets a decent launch from the inside, but you can see it's Gagne, just like Jason said, sweeping around the outside. That was due probably to some dirty track and wheel spin from Cameron Bobier. 
Bobia got off the line amazing, but it just wasn't enough. As you can see, the Gagne was able to go by, and, and so was PJ. PJ's start was pretty incredible also. Now Bobia is trying to make quick work. Oh, oh where are you oh, going, man. Cameron? Whoa! So Bobier sets off a chain reaction, and Matthew Skultz has to get on the brakes and contact as well. Matthew's got a problem, though. You can see there's a lot of smoke coming from that front brake where he's been nailed, and I don't know if that's oil or what that is, but he's got to get off the track. Yeah, he's definitely got to get off the track. He sees it now, so there might have been something in that incident. I'm trying to look at the rear tire. The rear tire looked really shiny to me. Oh, it's just It's just ripping. puking stuff, so yeah. there's going to be fluid all over the racetrack. You can see that R1 is expired. He got nailed. The red flag is already out, so I could see in the cameras when he went off into the grass that, uh, that there was oil all over that rear tire. Yeah, so the red Man, flag what a is out. For Bobier. Yeah, big break for Bobier. Boy, that was some clobbering that that bike took. He got slammed on the inside and maybe got a foot peg that goes through the case or whatever it was there, but you can see it's uh, it's happened way back in turn three. That's just horrible luck right there for Matthew Skultz. And Let's take another look, Jay, to see how this whole thing unfolded. At the time, my eyes were on Cameron Bobier and him going sideways. Yeah, you don't see Cameron Bobier make very many mistakes, but this here is just getting in a little bit too deep, running into the back of Gagne. He starts off a chain reaction, and you can see it was actually P.J. Jacobson that, pro that got stood up, and you'll see Matthew Skultz. Well, it's probably going to be a foot peg from P.J. Jacobson's bike right there, or swing arm. Look at that. Goes right into the front of the motor of Skultz. And then right now, as soon as he turns, I could see the shine on that rear tire. Yeah, it's already smoking right there just after the impact. So there was some type of a puncture. And it looked like quite possibly, Jay, you're correct, the back of the swing arm. Really hard to see. But all right, so that's red flag conditions. When we come back, we're going to get this whole situation sorted out for you. So hang tight. Medallia Superbike race number one. Hectic from the beginning. And we will continue this red flag coverage. Roger, you're watching the pictures. You called it before it even happened. I was sitting right here next to you. What did you see? Well, just like Cam got in there way too deep, you talk about the draft, and I think he was wanting to get his teammate, but he got sucked in there, lot, you know, really deep. And after that, you know, it looked like maybe the radiator on the front of Matthew Skoltz's bike because it happened. You could see the impact toward, toward the front, and uh, he was just leaking, and, you know, Cam Bobier doesn't like this and, you know, it's not what he wants. But, you know, what happened to Matt kind of bails him out because he was going to start in the back, you know, the first lap, a couple seconds behind the last place guy. Now he gets to grit up again. So, uh, you know, it's unfortunate for for Matthew Skultz. I mean, he was just an innocent bystander there, but that's part of racing. And you, you see Cameron go down there and apologize immediately to, to Jake Gagne and, uh, you know, just show that sportsmanship, like, hey, I made a mistake. And take a look at the replays here. We have two different angles. This is the first one, Roger. See, so look at Cam on the inside there. He's just, he's in there way too deep. And when you're in that deep, you're just, you're along for the ride. You know, you're just trying to get it stopped as quick as possible. Everybody else makes it through. Look at Bobby in there at this point. Both brakes locked up. I actually ran into Jake Gagne there, stood up. PJ and then he got into Matthew Skoltz and, and from here you can see the smoke it's coming from yeah. from right away and just luckily everybody stayed up through that now Matthew's bike is still out um, on the side of the racetrack what, what will they have to do now to get it back and to fix it so that he can take his grid position well the the crash truck would have to come out there and get him and bring it back uh. to pit road he cannot go behind pit wall and if they can do that and get that bike, you know, without going behind pit wall. And, but, uh, you know, you got to think about if it's a radiator or they can have time to change it this quick. So, unfortunately for them, if it was something small, they could get it fixed. But right now, the biggest thing is try to get that crash truck there as soon as possible. But also, if it's leaking, they might not even want to take it across the track, even on a trailer. There's certainly a lot of risk there trying to get it back to pit lane. Looking at Jake Gagne's face, we just have a very quick second here, Roger, but adrenaline. They had it going. How do they get it back? And I think for Cameron, he probably has the most adrenaline because he just, you know, he almost had a big crash. And for Jake, he just needs to do what he did last time. He got a really good start, and uh, he's put himself in a good spot. All right, the riders are going to take just a little seat. You see Jake Gagne trying to collect his thoughts again. We talked about having, having to – 
the ability to get going. They're going to get Matthew Skoltz's bike back. There's that crash truck that we were talking about. Get it back to pit lane. We'll see what the Westby crew is able to do with it. Uh, but this red flag is going to continue. We'll be back. Here's Greg and Jason. Welcome back to Brainerd International, looking at replays of why this red flag happened. Jason Pridmore, you can see Cambovier right there, tags the back of Jake Gagne off the start, and that started the chain reaction. That could have been so much worse than it was. You could see, when I saw Cam going down the inside like this, I knew he was looking for room to get that bike slowed down. He tags the back of Gagne, which then starts off a chain reaction. PJ reacted, Skoltz was to the outside. Now, at this point, Matthew doesn't realize the damage that had been done. Now, the, before this video that you see here, the first thing that Matthew did was try to make the corner workers aware that there was a huge problem. And once he saw that, then you could see some of the frustration. Just bad luck for Matthew, he did nothing wrong there it was just a racing incident all right so red flag rules with less than three laps complete original grid all riders may restart if they're medically fit so unfortunately for the Westby bike it's sitting there on the crash truck Hannah what do you got well, for Cameron Bobia, he made it out of that incident pretty unscathed. He's sitting here ready to go back out. Bike seems to be okay, but Cam, there's a lot to unpack with that incident. Tell us what happened. Yeah, I got a pretty bad jump off the line. Um, yeah, PJ and Jake got around me, and I went to the inside to, to try to try to pass pass uh, PJ, and I think I just over broke myself a little bit. I man, I'm so happy that uh, Jake and I stayed up after that one. I was. It's pretty scary, and uh, yeah, so light up and uh, definitely break, uh, break a little earlier this time. I saw you walk over and talk to Jake Gagne. What were you guys talking about? What did you have to say to him? I just told him, I just told him sorry because I, I got in a little hot. And, uh, but yeah, I'm super happy he stayed up and, and myself too. So uh, yeah, re-rack and uh, see how it goes. This will be your first race here that you've ever done since, you know, the last two seasons we raced here. You were not with us. You don't really have an idea of what to expect, but what are you hoping for? Man, we've had really good pace uh, all weekend so far. The Tyler's guys have been giving us a really good, PJ and, and myself, a really good bike. Uh, the BMW is really working well around here. And, uh, and yeah, I think uh, it should be interesting. I know Jake's got some really good pace as well. Um, so, so yeah, we'll see. Just uh, wanna wanna get going and, and kind of see how it unfolds. Cameron Bobier eager to get back on the bike, guys. Oh yeah, I'm sure he is, and at least he's got to start under his belt now to really understand what it's like to start here at VIR. But For this rider, Jay, that was probably a bit of a shock as he was just running his pace. The next thing you know. Yeah, but you see the respect that these sideways. guys. You see the respect that these guys have for each other, and uh, you know, for Gagne, he was just tipping into turn three. And, and you know, look, Bobia just said it straight. He's like, I just made a mistake. I outbroke myself a little bit going in there, and uh, it's just a shame for for you know, for Matthew. And you see how much oil there was on the track. He had no idea that his bike was leaking, and I think it'll be a pretty big cleanup. So. The siding laps and things are going to be pretty important for these riders to get their confidence in the surface out there in turn three. All right, so it looks like there's cleanup, and this is kind of an idea of where the oil is laid down on the track as the excellent crew here is hard at work, and so is Hannah. And Jake Ani is just looking on as they're showing where they're cleaning up that oil. So he has kind of a better idea before he heads back out. But Jake, take us through that incident with Bobier from your perspective. Well, I, I, you know, I got off to a great start. It's kind of like the, the outside is almost a better starting position here. And uh, I, I, I just was getting in there. I just felt a little nudge on my rear tire and I didn't. I didn't know what happened, but I, yeah, that's racing. You get sucked in there, and if there's anybody who's going to get it slowed down, it's Cam. So, um, yeah, hopefully we can all get a good clean start and just get this show on the road and, and have some good racing. Just kind of based on that, does that change anything that you plan to do off the start? No, no. I mean, hopefully we can get another jump like that. You know, this Yamaha gets off the line really nicely. So, uh, yeah, do it all over again. Sounds like a plan. Jake, I need calm, cool, and collected. Yeah, and Jay, we talked about really the positioning on the racetrack and what you'd alluded to is pole position is in a spot where on the regular motorcycles aren't going through that part of the racetrack and so it becomes a little bit dirty and doesn't have as much grip as the grid position that Jake Gagne was in too. And so as ironic as it might sound, qualifying in the third place position 
gives Gagne just a slight advantage just from a traction standpoint from the word go. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see these two, PJ and Matthew, talking to each other. But yeah, back to your point, it was great because Josh Hayes was talking to us a little bit earlier and, and he actually brought that up to me because I remember a couple years ago, Gagne started from pole. And if you remember, the bike spun up really bad on him and, and was going sideways on him at the start. And uh, and Josh reminded me of that this morning. And, and uh, it's exactly what we saw. It looked like Bobia got a decent launch. And I thought, wow, it, he, he's off the line. And then when I saw Gagne and PJ Jacobson swooping around the outside of him, it was probably a little bit of that wheel spin and, and maybe not as good of a jump as I saw. So here you go. This is, this is a West BR1. I mean, pretty much dumping all of the oil that that bike probably had in the motor um, onto the track. But again, this was something that Matthew did not know was, was happening. And uh, I'm just glad he didn't try tipping it in or doing anything like that. He was made aware of it very early. Yeah, and you can see there, right part of your screen, that he was kind of on the edge of the racetrack there trying to pull off once he discovered it. Well, as our crew continues to work on the track conditions, we'll step away from Brainerd International Raceway as we get closer and closer to getting this race underway. Medallia Superbike race number one. Well, after the incident in uh, Mission King of the Baggers qualifying, the, uh, the uh, oil cleanup crew here has had a lot of experience out there, and they're getting this one done. Jamie, thanks so much for, uh, for jumping in for a minute here. But uh, you know, what a somewhat chaotic start to a really crucial race here. And, uh, and uh, you know, what's your, your thought right now, Roger, in terms of, all right, what happens on this restart? Well, I think you just got to, if you got a good start, you're going to try to do the exact same thing again. Or if you got a bad start, you're going to try to figure out while you're sitting there, what did I do wrong? What could I do better? And, you know, I guess for, for like Cam Bobier making that mistake, all the other riders I think will be a little bit aware now going into turn three on that first lap that you can get sucked in with that draft. Yeah, and it's so strong around here, obviously, that uh, uh, that plays an absolutely huge role. And uh, I think, though, Jamie, it also shows coming in, as we've been talking about starting the second half of the season, that Cameron Bobia understands, that, you know, he's got to get some points. He's got to make up some, uh, some ground on Jake. Well, I think you see what, everything that's on the line. It, he talked about it earlier this weekend um, in our Live Plus coverage about the significance of this race and it being a track that he's never raced at before they came and they tested here because he knew that this was a critical part in the season and he was going to need that track time in order to be able to get up there with the front runners and unfortunately you know things didn't go his way there at the start of that race he put that on himself he apologized to the competitors I think it says a lot about the the rider that he is and you know he was that way before he went to race right. in, in Moto2 it wasn't a growth that happened but he comes back in and he respects the competition that's here and he knows he's got to put it all out there in order to beat him. Yeah, there's not a person in this paddock that that you know that that ever has questioned that uh, Cam Bobia is just a great person uh, in general for sure. And uh, uh, you know, mistakes happen. I'm, you know, you're riding at this level. You're in a championship battle. And Roger, you know, you've been there. You know, uh, there. You know, sometimes you just have to give it a go. And sometimes for, for like Jake understood because mm -hmm. everybody that's raced has did that before. You sure. got sucked in a little deeper than you wanted, and you got into somebody. And you know, it's an accident. You don't want it to happen, but you know it could you know happen to you as well so for both those guys it was awesome for uh you know like jamie said cambobia owned the mistake yep. you know it wasn't he didn't say something was wrong with the bike he just hey i made a mistake and uh you don't really see cambobia make too many mistakes like that and i want to ask you about josh hayes real quick does this help him it it, it gave him what 10 minutes uh, to be able to just sit and relax for a minute he here. He had an extra little break. Didn't yeah. he? <laughs> he, he left. He left the podium area, and he said, "Well, I guess I'm I'm warmed up now. I'm ready to go <laughs> after that Super Sport race." So he certainly, um, we saw him sitting down that entire time and just taking advantage of of the the air conditioning underneath those awnings. Yeah, I mean he's uh, you know getting ready to to climb back onto this beast here and get after it once again. So uh, we're getting a report it, as it comes in now. It will be 16 laps to go uh, at the restart. 16 laps to go, and it'll be your standard quick start. So they'll go out, come around, line up, and we will go racing. And uh, it's time for us uh, with that uh, to get it back over to Greg White, Jason Pridmore for the call of this restart here in Medallia Superbikes at Brainerd International Raceway.
Welcome back to Brainerd International Raceway, Medallia Superbike race number one. Bikes are back on track as the fine crew here at Moto America was able to get that oil cleaned up that fast, Jason Pridmore. I mean, that's pretty quick. Yeah, but it was in pretty much one spot, which is good. It's just down this big, long straightaway that they're going through. And really, it shouldn't be too big of a factor. They got to cross over it there in three, and hopefully that's where the majority of the stuff is down. As you can see, riders are going to get two looks at it. They're going to come have a siding lap here, come back to that grid, Greg, and then get another shot at it. But, uh, you know, it's it's funny because you could see it look in Cameron Bobier's face even a little bit that it, it didn't shake him up, but he was, you know, you could see that it, it getting into there a little bit deep and touching the back of Gagne. I think that now it's going to be even more important for him to get a good start because I think it'll be interesting to see if there's any, you know, if he's tentative at all getting down into turn three on that first lap. But getting these first two laps out of the way, the exciting lap and warm-up lap will help him a lot just get that, get rid of that feeling. All right, let's get down to Hannah who has more on Matthew Skultz. Hannah? I checked in with him just a bit ago and he said, you know, it's just another case of bad luck. He was in the wrong spot at the wrong time. He didn't have anywhere else to go. It wasn't until he got going and back on track that he realized there was a problem. Originally, he thought that maybe the tire was a little bit sandy. It was spinning up, but he went a little bit further and realized something must really be wrong and looked down and saw the smoke. And the team is still looking to diagnose what exactly happened, but they think it's radiator related as far as that oil down on the track. Yeah. Interesting. It looked okay. like that foot peg probably went through the radiator. And then, you know, obviously, I can't imagine it overheating and blowing up quite that quick. So it wouldn't be surprised to see if there's a, a crack somewhere else other than just the radiator. Yeah, that's a bit of a blow to the Westby program. They'll be back tomorrow, of course, here in Medallia Superbike. We have a one bike rule. So they're only allowed to have one bike that's teched. And the other part of the rule is you have to finish the race in the mi motorcycle you started on. So mm. there's no opportunity, even if they did have a, a backup bike ready to go, they couldn't rush it through tech inspection and, and then have it out on the racetrack because you have to start that or finish the bike with what you start all right so here's the original grid positions as we talked about and the laps have been reduced from 18 down to 16 for medallia superbike race number one and so obviously matthew skult's not going to be on the grid because he doesn't have a motorcycle to race and it looks like huh pj jacobson is told that he's going to be moved to the back of the grid interesting So as they get going, quick start procedure. Tell us a little bit about that, JP. Yeah, quick start is just what it is, Greg. We saw them go out for that siding lap. They came around, got with a crew member. Crew member then uh, put them in their, their perspective positions, and um, now they're out on their warm-up lap. So yeah, I'm a little confused by this. I'm sure you're probably gonna ring in and tell me what's going on with the PJ Jacobson thing at some point, but I'm not really sure or understanding why he would get put to the back of the grid yet. Uh, what we're finding out is that it looks like they changed the rear tire and under red flag conditions here, unless it's Dunlop sanctioned, you're not allowed to change your tire. So 99 back of the grid for changing a rear Interesting. tire. Okay, yeah, that's, that makes sense then. So uh, maybe PJ wasn't uh, aware of that rule because he definitely looks surprised by that. So. Expect the 99 to come charging through the pack from the back. And, you know, Greg, again, this is another one of those situations. PJ is capable of winning these races. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a bummer now that we're going to have to see him come from the back of the grid because, uh, you know, the guy every weekend, it seems like, is always able to put that one lap race pace in and get better as the weekend kind of goes. And uh, for sure, I would have put him on a podium potential today. But now that's going to be made a little bit more difficult coming from the back. Okay, so now what we're hearing is further investigation about the rear tire change, confirming that there was no tire change. So PJ wow. will be moved to his original grid position second. I wouldn't think that they would do, I wouldn't think that the Tyler's guys would make a tire change unless there was an actual problem with the tire. Yeah, like but if then, there was like oil on the yes, side or something but, like that, but, but he wasn't Dunlop, involved. Yeah. Dunlop and Motor America would have got more involved on that. So it looks like they're gonna, that's great. I'm glad for, for PJ that he's gonna get to take his original grid spot. Yeah, and so the officials are waving him on saying that he is okay to start in his original grid position. So there goes the 99 Titler's bike. It's his second year on this BMW M1000RR as PJ continues to get quicker and quicker, quicker over time. And of course, front row, second place on the grid after qualifying at a 131.0. So it's Cam Bobier, PJ Jacobson, and Jake Gagne on the front row. Matthew Skultz not there in P4, then Brandon Posh on the Vision Wheel M4X Star Suzuki. Next to his teammate, Richie Escalante, Josh Heron, Josh Hayes, and Bobby Fong, your first three rows. Here we go, the restart. Lights off, we're going. 
So clutches are out. Bobier with another good launch, but look at Jake Gagne sweep around the outside. And there's P.J. Jacobson again. And how about Heron? Here comes that Ducati on the outside as well, Greg. Looks like he's going to slot himself into fourth. Was going to, but Brandon Posh goes up underneath Heron in the in inside of turn two. Look at that pink helmet on the inside. That's the 96 of Brandon Posh. There goes Bosch, and no, around the outside goes Josh Heron. And Cameron Bobier holds on to that position, and we didn't see that big, bold move from the number six this time around. Yeah, you can let things play out a little bit now, can Cam Bobier. And uh, th these are the guys up in the front that were right there at the start the last time. So Gagne's going to lead him out of turn five, headed towards turn six now. Bobier there, Heron. You know, always comes to race, Greg, does Josh Heron. He comes from the third row. We haven't spoke at all about the number two on that Ducati, that War Horse Ducati, pretty much all weekend. He's been pretty quiet. It's a track that we know that Josh isn't a fan of, let's just say, from testing even a couple of years ago. But, man, when that light goes out, he's always there, and he's got a tremendous start on that Ducati. It's easy for, for us to forget that Heron who's on that War Horse HSBK Racing Ducati, is in the first season on that team. And this is a unique racetrack in terms of how flat it is. And so that team trying to find a good setup for Heron. They continue to work, and right now it's paying dividends. PJ goes wide. Yeah, so PJ Jacobson trying to hold off the advancements of his teammates. He just got into that turn a little bit too deep, but it was able to get it turned and, and back underneath him. Also, Josh Hayes has moved up. Greg, he's up to six. So keep an eye on the number four, trying to go forward. There he is in the bottom of your screen. He wants to try to chase down these five leaders. Brandon Posh has just slipped back a little bit now to seventh. Cameron Bobier has got to be feeling the oh. urgency right now. He's got to get around his teammate if he's got any shot at Jake Gagne, because even though Gagne is already spinning up the tire oh early, our Lucas Oil helicopter shot from that overhead, thing. he's still in command of this race. Look at that thing get off the corner, too. That R1 shoots out of turn three, but he had the thing sideways in turn two. And I think the only worry there, Greg, is we're on the first of 15 laps. And for that bike to be as sideways as it was there, going to be flat out in fifth gear, I believe, is what they are through that corner right now. They get, they kind of get in there. They roll off the throttle just a little bit to get the bike to turn. They get down to the curbing, and they're right back in full gas again. And Hannah, the 99, P.J. Jacobson, looking awfully strong right now. He is, and we've seen flashes of brilliance from P.J. Jacobson on this bike throughout the season. He's really starting to come into his own and get a lot more comfortable. He likes the layout here especially. You know, not a lot of the riders say this is their favorite track. And after some changes overnight, he felt even better today. His goal overall is to really not lose touch with the leaders. And while we're only two laps in, he's certainly maintaining distance from Jake here. But he said he's got podium pace. The question is, will he have race win pace? Well, yeah, and really what we've seen from the 99, though, in, in, in part of the program, that's the hiccup, is the latter part of the race, Jay, where he starts to lose a little bit of traction. So at the beginning of the race, we know PJ can be strong. Gagne goes 131.503. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's the first flying lap for him. So a 31-5 for Gagne, setting the pace. 31-5-6-3 by P.J. and a 31-6 by Cameron Bobier. Mm, is Cam going to be he's not quite close enough, or is he? Yeah, he's not quite close enough to look at doing anything with P.J. And Cam's going to see that Gagne's not just getting away. 31-5. Oh, oh, Bobier! Man. Unbelievable! Oh, that's Almost a big one. saved it in the middle of the racetrack. And oh, it was their contact with his bike with another rider. It was so close. So Cameron oh, Bobier. Oh, 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 oh. Jeez. Oh, wow. And there's yellow flags out there, Greg, but these guys just got to get their heads up. When you see a yellow flag, you got to get your head around the corner because you know something big has happened up front. But for Bobier, he gets himself off the track, and Gagne almost gets so close to the edge when he goes there into turn seven and eight. But, uh, man, I'm so glad to see that nobody collected Bobier there. And the corner workers are going to be going out there trying to get that incident cleaned up before the leader gets there. But P.J. has closed the gap. P.J. Jacobson, number 99, has closed the gap on Jake Gagne with no idea what's going on behind him. And it's all eyes forward in Medallia Superbike race number one. 14 laps to go currently in this one. There's a look at Josh Hayes. I was just getting ready to say that Bobby is not going to be too worried because PJ's running 31.5 as well, Greg. Same lap time on the last by, lap by. So I was thinking that Bobby was going to be able to kind of hang, let these guys go away. As you see Gagne a lot get a spin. big wobble between turns one and two. Now let's take another look. Bobby is in behind PJ here. That bike starts going sideways awful early, and it's going to spin him up, and then it's going to re 
hinge itself, Greg, and throw him up off the high side. And that's a crash that we don't get to see very often anymore. Now he's laying in the middle of the racetrack. Good for Posh, Fong. All these guys get their bikes in a spot there where they see him. And a couple of riders even had their hands up. Hayes almost, almost. collected that motorcycle. Yeah, almost back there. Wow, and that was a big one. And you can see also, see all the fiberglass that was already on the ground? That's his hands or something going up through the windscreen. That's why you saw so much glass already on the track. And this is where Gagne gets ever so close to the edge of that racetrack every lap. A good job by the corner workers here at BIR to get that incident taken care of before the leaders came through as we continue on with racing as P.J. Jacobson on the tailpipe, 99. Number one, Jake Gagne trying to hold him off. And back behind him, riders continue to set their personal best splits. As Richie Escalante in fourth place, trying to get around Josh Heron and set sail towards these two. And it and really threw a couple people back, Greg, because I saw Josh Hayes, he was up there. Posh was behind him by about two seconds before that incident. So Posh now up to fifth, Hayes sixth, Bobby Fong seventh. Yeah, it looked there for a moment initially in at the initial crash that Hayes made a contact. Here goes PJ, thought he had an ocean. Our Lucas Oil helicopter shots. Man, out of that turn one to turn two, the BMW accelerates so well with PJ on it. And it looks like gagne has got that bike in knots as it, as it exits turn one. But for PJ right now, he's, he's there, isn't he? I mean, now he can just kind of pick and choose his place of where he thinks he would like to try to make a pass and then see if he can make it stick. Of course, PJ Jacobson looking for his first medallion Superbike race win. This would be something else as we have Cameron Bobier, Jake Gagne, Skultz, Hayes, Heron, and Fong, all race winners in this class. Competed at the beginning of this race, obviously Bobier out. And the other thing you've got to remember too is right now Gagne probably doesn't know that Bobier's out unless it's been put on his board. PJ is going to see his board say plus two or plus three and wonder what's been going on behind him. So neither one of these two guys at the front are probably going to know that Bobier is actually out of this race. So Bobier tried to put the pressure from the championship perspective onto Jake Gagne. He didn't want to give him too much room, but a huge mistake and on the ground. And so in terms of that championship point, now all eyes turn to Josh Heron right now because Josh Heron, who's in third place, is the closest in the championship, still circulating around the racetrack. There's the number two going by with Escalante just behind him. And there is Superbike rookie Brandon Pox, who showed up just a race ago at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca. And he's in a fierce battle with Josh Hayes, who's filling in for Cameron Peterson, gone for the rest of the season on that fresh and lean progressive Yamaha. Left part of your screen from the Lucas Oil helicopter is your race lead. And here is the battle between Posh Hayes and Bobby Fong as Hayes goes up the inside. That is the battle for fifth place. Yeah, and we really haven't said enough about Brandon Posh. I think M4 XR Suzuki have found a guy here who's young and uh, he's willing to learn, and he's, he's worked hard to get to this position. And I think for him to put that bike fifth on the grid, it was pretty impressive at Brainerd. And look at Bobby Fong and Hayden Gillum just behind that, this three, these three guys here. But Bobby Fong also doing a really good job here running seventh on that wrench R1. We saw Dave Anthony on that bike earlier. It's a, it's a, an attack bike from, I believe, last year. I think it's Correct. Jake Gagne's, Gagne's bike mm -hmm. from last year. So Dave Anthony now riding Super Sport, elected to put Bobby Fawn on that motorcycle. And Bobby, this is probably the best run that we've seen from him. But for Brandon Potts right now, he's getting a little bit of chance to learn a little bit from Josh Hayes. And I think that if he can kind of stay in that number four's wheel tracks, he's going to learn a lot. So as you see, P.J. Jacobson on the left hand of your screen, still not at the back of Jake Gagne. Totally different views of the leaders, too, with the way their motorcycles work. And you can see Gagne coming out of some of the slower corners, launching the front wheel for a moment. PJ's bike seems more in line on that left part of your screen. Here we go. There's the number one and the 99. So PJ choosing at the moment to run the same pace, but they went personal best split in sector number two three sectors ago, Jason. So they're still pushing really hard. 31 fives for both these riders as their fastest lap of the race. Last time by going 31 nine. So only four tenths of a second slower than their best. And the guy that qualified on the third row of the grid that we hadn't talked about that we were starting to is Josh Heron. He actually was quicker than them a lap ago. This last time by, he did lose two tenths to the leaders, but Heron trying to get away from Escalante. Escalante is still searching for that first Superbike podium. So a lot of race laps, still 10 laps to go. I have also seen Corey Alexander in and out of the pits. 
And of course, Josh Heron on a seven podium streak at the moment. There he is, number two on that Warhorse HSBK Racing Ducati entry. He's won a race this year already and was so excited about it at Road America. The rider who's been in and out of this class for the last couple seasons, of course, a national champion back in 2013 is Josh Heron, Hannah. And Josh made some huge changes to the bike this morning, or his team did rather. He's looking to get more comfortable overall on the bike, and he's finally feeling a bit better, but now he has his work cut out for him starting from seven. He feels the most consistent in sector four. He's really strong under hard braking, but he's not as confident pushing in sector one. There's some bumps there that leave room for error, and he doesn't want to take any unnecessary risk. Yeah, and he's going to continue to get this bike better, is Heron, and this is good for him for the championship. These are what you have to do, Greg. They always say you win your championships on your worst days, and if a third is going to be Josh Heron's worst day, especially coming from the third row of the grid, I'd say that that's almost a win. But I don't count this guy out. He's only 2.2 seconds behind P.J. Jacobson, and right now, for the first time, just seeing ever such a little tiny slight gap between those two leaders, 32-1 that time by Fergonier. P.J. only lost two tenths, so we're going to see if that makes a difference here in this lap. Now, a couple things I want to point out that these two guys do different as they roll here into turn four, five, and six. When they come out of these S's, they're going to take a quick run down to turn seven and eight, where we've seen Gagne make that mistake a couple of years ago, Greg. Well, if you watch what these two guys do, when they get to this big right carousel turn, the R1 actually gets back to first gear real early. And man, is he close to the grass again. Scares me every time. But here, that Yamaha gets itself down into first gear. Now, if you watch PJ just behind, you're going to see he's going to back shift right about there. So Gagne is able to run one gear all the way around that corner and keep that bike at a high momentum with a lot of RPM. When he rolls the throttle off, the bike just turns. For PJ, it's going to be a little bit more technical. For anybody on a street bike that's ever tried to shift their bikes, sometimes get that false neutral upright, to get that bike at full lean angle and go from second to first gear takes a lot of trust. Yeah, it certainly does. And, of course, there was a rule change this year for Medallia Superbike as we have more... Uh, the teams are allowed. Ryder has to choose at the beginning of the season a transmission that you don't actually have a neutral in first gear if you choose it. We know that Jake Gagne runs that, so basically there's a, a lever that activates the transmission and he goes first through sixth without that neutral in the middle like your normal street bike. And that makes it a little bit easier too to maintain that RPM and that gear as you don't have to worry about going from first to second. But the race up front continues. You can see Gagne, he likes to get the rear tire spun. It helps to steer his Yamaha R1 in the direction he wants to go. And he's also a master of getting that motorcycle off the corner and up onto the meat of the tire to maximize the drives. It's Gagne, PJ Jacobson going at it in first place. And you can see ever so slightly, Gagne starting to pull out a tenth here and a tenth there. And PJ's got to have a lunge to close that gap. All the while, Josh Heron, he's closed to two seconds. <laughs> yeah, he's 2.1 now behind PJ. So Heron just is not letting these guys go, as you can see, Greg, that he's uh, pretty hungry. Again, another guy going back to first gear. You see how he's got to stand the bike upright just for a minute to get it back to first gear? That just takes time. And I think that for Gagne, that's a nice thing to have in your pocket, knowing that you can run your bike around there in that gear, especially towards the end of the lap, because it's going to make it a lot harder for these guys. I know it doesn't seem like match, but it's one extra downshift very late in that corner. So part of the changes that Hannah was talking about was they changed the, the pivot placement on that motorcycle to allow the mo Josh to spin the tire a little bit more freely, as well as front end changes. And Josh said, look, we just haven't made a lot of changes to that Ducati during the course of this season. And when I brought up the, the attitude of this racetrack being a more flat racetrack, and he said, it's definitely something that we've been talking about because we've had to make some changes because this is the flattest racetrack that we go to and the way that the motorcycle works and the characteristics. I mean, even when you look at a place like Road America, Jason, mm -hmm. you have some really dramatic downhill, hard-breaking corners that you don't have here at Brainerd. Oh, there's no question. There's definite elevation at Road America, um, and it just puts different loads on the bikes, and these bikes are so sensitive to changes and the things that you do that when you get to a track that is very, very flat, like you say here at Brainerd, uh, you know, sometimes it's the hardest way to get bikes to, to, to have any kind of grip to them. So. Gagne again rolls off into here. 
I love it when he gets that close to the grass, Shane. I don't. I can just, I can just see I you. Don't. <laughs> well, that's one of the it things that flinch every time. Yeah, you and I talked about it, Jay. What oftentimes motorcycle riders don't understand is when they do make the transition from left to right, you're not pivoting directly on the tires. The tires actually move a little bit. When you go left, the tires move a little right. When you go right, the tires move a little bit left. And that's what you see is Gagne is on his line, but as he transitions the bike, it gets awfully close to that grass. Yeah, it really does. i tell you right now, these war horse Ducati team have got to be pretty proud of their guy. He's, he's continuing to just try to trim this gap down on that Ducati. And here you're going to get a chance to look at it as he comes out of turn six. He rolls down, and this is going to be from second up to third. And then you can see how close he is. So, I mean, it is an inch, uh, you know, from, from going really bad. I don't want to see that happen. But it goes lap, lap, lap after lap, lap, after and, lap consistently. And that is definitely the sign of a, a high quality and unbelievably skilled racer in Jake Gagne. Back One, in the 31s. Yeah, so Gagne back into the 131.9 bracket as PJ loses another three tenths that lap. And Josh Heron matching PJ Jacobson. So at the moment, not able to make any ground up on the 99 is the number two. Richie Escalante in fourth, just ahead of Josh Hayes. Bobby Fong gotten around Brandon Posh. Yeah, look at this. Hayes, after riding a super sport race, jumps on this bike, running fifth. Now he's on the back of a guy he's been coaching. So it's pretty funny to think about that because Hayes has just done a nice job of reacclimating himself to this superbike. Jason, Jason, I asked him what some of the differences were, you know, between these two motorcycles. Obviously, they're both a Yamaha, but Hayes hasn't raced a superbike since 2017. He said the lines are similar, but the shift points and the brake markers are definitely different. Uh, you know, the whole first decade of his career, 1999 to 2008, he raced in two classes. He's a bit out of practice, so it's kind of hard to adjust, but it definitely makes it easier to go from the super sport to the superbike motorcycle, and especially coming off a race victory in super sport as well. I think one of the key things that you said there, Hannah, and I've talked to Josh at length about this, obviously known him for many, many years. He says the lines don't change for me, you know, whether it's a big bike or a small bike. And I think, Greg, sometimes that gets lost amongst riders, even at track days and things. They think that the, a certain CC bike is meant to go in a certain spot. And you can do certain things as he goes up underneath Escalante. Escalante is probably thinking, is this even happening right now? <laughs> as Hayes goes through and puts himself up into fourth. But, you know, for Josh, it's about repetition. It's about consistency. And he does things a little bit different on this bike than he will on the super sport bike. But the line choices and things like that aren't going to change that much for him. Yeah, the electronics are totally different on the super bike and talking to Josh Hayes and how they work. And there's reactive and, and predictive traction control that's mixed in amongst the Fresh Lean Progressive Yamaha. And Hayes has had some experience, you know, um, on this motorcycle. Jay, of course, he did a session at Road America earlier this season. Plus, was it over this winter or the winter before where you, Jason Pridmore, and Josh Hayes both got a day on this very motorcycle? Yeah. Was that was that That's two, two Decembers ago? Two Decembers ago. Yeah, and I was I was already begging Richard Samboli last night. I saw him out eating dinner. <laughs> I want to do that again. That was a lot of fun for me, and it was a lot of fun for Josh and I. We, sat on a phone for like two hours talking about that day, but I just want to bring something up. Fastest guy on the, lap, the track that last lap, this guy right here. 31.9 for Josh Hayes that last time through. Don't think that he's just giving up on the thought that that podium is just sneaking up in front of him in Josh Heron, although Heron will be incredibly difficult to catch with just four laps to go. Josh comes through this time at a 32.1, so he knocked two tenths. He's 2.8 behind Heron right now. But I'll tell you what this is doing for Hayes. This is gathering data. This is getting him more and more laps under race pace and race conditions. And this is going to give him a lot of confidence going into tomorrow. There's still a couple of races left in this season for Medallia Superbike. Three to be uh, precise, pit race, Coda, and Jersey. And we don't know what the future holds for Josh Hayes filling in for Cameron Peterson, who is out the rest of the season. But that data could be very important if he gets to race more races this season. But Cam, uh, P.J. Jacobson not giving up on Jake Gagne as he goes a couple tenths of a second quicker on the last lap by. It's up to Gagne to answer out front as we continue to watch the four who is in fourth place, Escalante in fifth. And here's Bobby Fong, who's doing a ton of stuff this weekend, Jason. Of course, he's racing Mission uh, King of the Baggers, but he also works for Day and Easy. He's race support, so if you're supported by Day and Easy and you have 
Uh, you need gloves, you need boots, you know, your leathers, whatever you need. Bobby Fong's working under a canopy as yeah, well. He is a busy is. rider. Yeah, and then, you know, for Bobby, I think this is the by far the best we've seen him on this motorcycle. He took over the reins of this bike at the ridge, had a little bit of bad luck up there, then he went to Laguna, kind of the same thing, had an accident there in turn six. But Bobby Fong is a superbike winner. We've seen that in the past, and of course, he's a champion. Uh, we've seen him win championships in our series as well. He'll just continue to try to make this bike better and better and more suited for him. So Bobby Fong, who won those races in 2020, not too far away. And then here's Aiden Gillum. So the 69, Aiden Gillum having a good run as Posh continues to fade. So it's Posh behind him. So the 69 on the Disrupt Racing GSXR 1000. And Hayden Gillum also a busy boy racing in Mission King of the Baggers. Racing Stock Thousand, King of the Baggers, and Superbike. Yeah. I mean, three in a weekend is a lot of a lot of work. So he's got six races all together. And uh, he still has another one today as he's already done the Stock Thousand race. So he's still got another one left over uh, this afternoon. This motorcycle and this team continue to develop that motorcycle in the direction they want to go. So it's not like they went to the Vision Wheel M4X Star Suzuki team and said, give us what you got. We're going to do our own thing. And it's been quite successful for Hayden Gillum and Disrupt Racing as they continue to develop this motorcycle, add bits and pieces, and a lot of knowledge and data to it as well. Left part of your screen is your race leader, Gagne. And you can see that Yamaha R1 coming off the corner. And PJ's still there, though, isn't he? He's still I mean, there. It's tremendous. kind of stabilized at about a half a second. So you have to wonder what PJ Jacobson has for these last two and a half laps, as that's about what we have race distance. You got to admire what Brandon Posh has done, the 96, who just went through the screen on the right part of your screen, starting fifth and continuing to learn on that full blown Suzuki factory effort. Moving back to Ashton Yates, the number 22, of course. You know, his dad, Aaron, raced here. That's the Aftercare Shivey Racing BMW. That's an S1000RR. One of the biggest things you'll notice with Corey Alexander, who goes up the inside, going sideways, trying to get around him, runs out of racetrack. Ashton gets him back. But you can see the arrow on the front of that bike. So the 22 is on the S1000RR, and the bike behind him, Corey Alexander, on the Titler Cycle Machine. That's the M1000RR. Both motorcycles available to purchase. Both still in the arsenal. Of course, the M1000RR, you can see the arrow difference. That arrow on the front of the bike. And so for, these two having a good go. And for Corey, even though he had qualifying this morning, he was in and out of the pits. Obviously, that bike built overnight so that he's able to make the race today. And uh, for Corey, this is just going to be a matter of getting laps. He is a lap down, Greg. So it's Jake Gagne out front. Again, with the half a second gap to P.J. Jacobson. Now PJ, he's put the pressure on Gagne all race long. Now we throw in a little bit different of a scenario. Lap traffic coming up. I think they're gonna get, they're gonna, I think it's Zach Schumacher, it is. It they're is gonna, Zach. Yep. They're gonna end up getting him in a decent spot, I think, after they come out of this left into this next right. Both riders should be able to sneak by Zach down this little straightaway here, probably getting the blue flag as well. Let's see, he does. Good man, Zach, gets, just moves over the way. And you can see the white and the blue flags now, Greg, as we're on our last lap. There goes Heron through, there goes Hayes. So uh, still Hayes operating in fourth spot, 32 flat. Again, he was quicker than all the leaders in front of him. So Jake Gagne out front. Now the hammer goes down. He's on that Dunlop. R0 tire, that's the softest front tire available in Jace. And one thing we didn't talk about was Gagne is not one who likes change. Since the beginning of the R tire designation, it's been R3, 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 R3. Unless, of course, like at Laguna where they were eating front tires, they were forced to go something a little different. But that R0 tire, Gagne gave it a try. It's a Josh Hayes special. He loves that tire in Super Sport. Josh Hayes has been trying it on the Superbike, and Gagne knows what's at stake. Stop talking. All right, you see, you see Gagne just uh, last lap here, Greg, as he goes into the, the last little bit of right now. He's going to be pretty home free. This is where the acceleration of the Yamaha has been so good. Oh. PJ closes up on the back. He wants to take one last shot at him as they go through this fast right. I don't think he's close enough, but PJ has put on a great effort, and uh, they're going to get through this last left. And Tyrai, see PJ tries to square him up in the last right-hander. DJ Jacobson with one last corner to do it in. He's trying to get a drive on Gagne. He knows he's been spinning. 
So here we go. Gagne behind the bubble, and he gets to the flag first and gets another win. And how about Josh Heron able to keep his podiums alive? Josh Hayes in fourth. Good run for him. P.J. Jacobson with the pressure all race long. 32-5. P.J. goes three-tenths of a second quicker on that last lap, but will fall short by 19 hundredths of a second. And here's that race pace, Jason, we talk about. And this one, you can see normally, Jay, when you see the first five or six laps of Gagne, mm -hmm. it's all fast pressure. But you can see when you look at lap six and seven, laps 10 and 11 and yep. 13, the pressure PJ put on him. And the whole time, PJ didn't let him go, did he? I'm wondering if he lost his knee puck or something. He's kind of looking at his right knee puck. You saw him looking back as well. I bet he's probably wondering where Cameron Bobier fit into this mix. And we're just hoping right now, haven't heard anything yet, but let's just hope that Cameron Bobier is actually okay from that big high side early in the race. Yeah, we can't wait to find out what the what the deal is with him, but when we come back, we're gonna to talk to Gagne and find out how he dealt with the pressure of P.J. Jacobson. And as Jake Gagne continues on his victory lap here, uh, just a, a great ride. But we had talked about it a little bit here before the race that we just had a feeling that PJ uh, was just dialed in to this track and, and that bike. And uh, what a run he gave Jay. Yeah, great run by PJ. And, you know, PJ's getting close to winning one of these Superbike yes, races. Road is. America was kind of the same thing. He had to pace. Uh, you know, just to kind of get up there but not able to take a shot. But PJ's been riding really well. If you go back to Laguna, he was pretty, he was one of the fastest the first day. And then he had that crash in the yeah. second qualifier, totaled his bike, and it kind of put him back a little bit. But then he comes here and he's fast again all day Friday this morning. And in that race right there, he was applying the pressure to Jake, and he got close. That last, those last oh, two yeah, corners, he, he he was on about another bike length, and I think he would have tried to put it up the inside of Jake there in that last right hander. Yeah, I mean he was three tenths quicker on that last lap. Uh, and I know you were up here almost laughing at me, wincing every time Josh would uh, would turn into turn seven, but he's within inches of dropping that tire off the outside edge of the track. But somehow uh, he does it just like clockwork. Every lap makes it work. Let's talk Josh here Josh Heron I think that's a gut check drive for him you know we know he's not feeling completely healthy he's, he's certainly better uh, but he the bike doesn't seem to like this place Josh isn't crazy about it and yet working with that Warhorse HSBK team he gets a bike underneath him and rides it well enough to be a really competitive podium yeah just steady yeah. you know then it, he's yeah. got himself in the title hunt this year by doing what he's doing taking what the race gives him and you see Bobier there that's such a good thing to see Really good to see him up and uh, walking pretty gingerly there, but it's just great to see see him up and walking. That was a that was a big crash. You don't see Cambovier high side very no. often or make a mistake in general. So it's great to see him up and walking, and hopefully everything's okay and able to, to make that race tomorrow. And we have a three rider battle at the front. But you know, back to to Josh Heron is just kind of using that experience he's got. And, you know, not – he yep. knew he had a third-place bike. He didn't ride over the top to try to catch the two guys in front of him, kind of manage that gap behind him and gets another podium. He, I mean, it's no – We've seen the results this weekend. They've struggled a little bit, and yeah. to come away with the podium is a good bounce back. I think so. And how about Josh Hayes? I mean, you know, wins that super sport race. That's the record. But wins that super sport race. He's 48 years old, has to turn around, jump onto that super bike, and then ends up – Near the end of the race, one of the quickest guys on the track ends up in fourth. Uh, I mean, just another remarkable performance by the Evergreen Hayes. And under six seconds from the victory. Yeah. And and it wasn't like, you know, Jake had a big lead in the last two or three laps. He backed off a little bit. He was pushed all the way to the end. So for uh, Josh Hayes, he was coming. He had to come through the pack, and he was, like you said, he was one of the quickest guys there toward the end. And Great, great ride by him. Absolutely. Richie Escalani, another top five. He's probably getting a little tired of those, would like a podium. Hayden Gillum, I thought, uh, backing up what he did in the uh, Steel Commander Stock 1000 class with that dominant win. Really good ride on that sort of hybrid super bike there up into seventh. And let's give a shout out. Gabrielle De Silva and Nolan Lampkin dueling again, uh, ending out uh, winning the Superbike Cup with Gabrielle De Silva and the 71 Steel Commander bike. 
margin of victory there, 51 thousandths of a second over Nolan Lampkin. Those guys just find each other on the track, and it is absurdly close and absolutely great fun. So that's how it plays out. But in the end, this guy uh, gets himself another win, and with the number six of uh, Cameron Bobier uh, having his off, uh, it's a big, big, big point swing here for Jake Gagne. And uh, for Cam Bobier, where he went off is an awfully fast part of that track. So, so good to see him up and walking across the track. So uh, we're going to get it back over and hear from our podium contenders. Medallia Superbike coverage is brought to you by Medallia, the pioneer in customer and employee experience. By Dunlop, the official tire of the Moto America Championship Series. And by Geico Motorcycle. Visit Geico.com to see how easy covering your ride can be. Welcome back to Brainerd. Moments ago, Cameron Bobier. Good to see him up and walking wow. across the track. And he had a, uh, a view of that race from where he ended up. But this is the celebration of Jake Gagne coming in after a big win. Let's take a look at those final results. As we know, Gagne ends up winning over P.J. Jacobson by .195 seconds. Heron right there, Jay, 3.4 back. Josh Hayes, third fastest lap of the race. Oh, my gosh, 5.8 back, crazy. Yeah, Rich Escalante, Bobby Fong, Gillum, Posh, and Hannah is with our winner right now. Jake Gagne led every single lap of that race after the restart. But, Jake, you, before you even had the chance to settle into a rhythm, the red flag came out. How do you refocus? yourself to get not only such a good launch, but to, to keep off your competitors when PJ was hot on your tail the whole entire race. Yeah, it's always a bummer to get a red flag like that. Um, but, you know, this Yamaha always gets off the line good. And like I said earlier, it's almost it's almost better starting on the outside of one. You know, you can kind of roll some speed. But, um, yeah, hats off to PJ and Josh. And I didn't see, but I know Bobier went down, and that's such a bummer to see because he was the guy setting the pace this weekend, and I'm sure it's going to be a good fight tomorrow. But hats off to the Fresh Lean Tech Performance Yamaha crew, um, making steady improvements still, and they're helping me make, be a better rider every day. And um, it was that race was tougher than I thought, hot and greasy and slick. Um, I was just trying to keep it upright and not make any mistakes. I knew it was PJ right there. I could hear him, hear him in some of those turns. and. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to be smart, and we brought it home, you know, and I, I know it's going to be even tougher tomorrow. Everybody's going to step it up. Obviously, like I said, I hope Bobier's all, all good, and uh, hats off to the team. Hats off to Josh for, for Hayes getting that, that record-breaking win earlier, and I know you rode a strong race that time, so it shows this Yamaha R1 is rolling good. Congrats, Jake. Second place today goes to P.J. Jacobson, and P.J., you were able to stick with Jake Gagne for the entirety of that race. How important was this podium, but also that performance? Yeah, for sure. You know, it was um, it was a tough race and all the stuff going on at the beginning, you know, with what happened with Cam and then me and, and, and Schultz, you know, I had a problem and I, I had no grip after that, like, crash incident and everything, so I was kind of freaking out. And, um, yeah, it was good. We kind of got our stuff together and uh, got my head back in uh, order. And, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a tough fight with Jake. You know, I just... Uh, I think at the beginning I should have made uh, tried to make a pass and stuff when I had more grip, but then once we... Um, I had the same grip level. It was kind of hard to uh, to pass him. I'd catch him in certain sections, and then he'd pull away. So uh, it's just a bummer what happened to my teammate because he would have been there the, the whole time. And, um, yeah, we'll just move on and get ready for race two tomorrow. I just want to thank my whole team, Tyler Cycle Racing Team, Michael Kiley. Um, whole team has been doing a great job. So uh, I think we're just uh, always making improvements and stuff. And it was a hot, greasy race, so um, we'll see what happens tomorrow. Congrats, PJ. A Yamaha, a BMW, and we have a Ducati of Josh Heron rounding out the podium. Josh, you had a front row seat there, and you were really able to use your expertise to evade running over Cameron Bobby after that crash, but kind of take us through that and how you are able to gather yourself up and focus and charge toward this podium. Yeah, that was scary. That was uh, for sure a, a bummer to see Cam go down. I, I think I lost like two or three seconds right there when that happened, so I... It was so difficult to try to claw those guys back up. I just didn't have it today. But the boys made a huge improvement on the V4R today. I felt really strong. 
I just didn't have it for him there at the end. Uh, but I want to give a huge shout out to the whole Warhorse HSBK Racing team. Thank you to Devont, um, everybody that supports us. I, I have this 1995 Freddie Spencer replica right here for my boy Ferracci, and uh, he wasn't able to make it out this weekend. So I got the newspaper article from when he won the Italian championship on the back and then the favorite uh, saying right there for him. So this is for you, Ferracci. Hopefully we can get it uh, further up on the podium tomorrow. But uh, thanks to the huge crowd at Brainerd for coming out. This place is amazing. I have so much fun just hanging out with the crowd here. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we can get a better day tomorrow. Very cool to have someone like Araldo Ferracci in your corner. Josh Heron rounding out your podium, guys. Absolute legend in Araldo Ferracci. Yeah, no question. It's cool to see him pay homage to that. And I think he's going to be a big problem for these guys tomorrow after what I saw today. Uh, 48 points back now is Josh Heron. 59 points back for, is Cameron Bobier. So that was a big hit in the points from him. And you can see rounding out the top five, Escalante and PJ does a nice job today. He's top five in the points. Only eight races remain in the season for Medallia Superbike. And, of course, Gagne and his crew are going to definitely do some math to find out how this championship is going to pan out. Well, that certainly was a wild one here. Medallia Superbike race number one. We get to do it again with Medallia Superbike race number two from Brainerd. There's the time for Hannah and Jason. I'm Greg. Thanks so much for checking it out. We know Cameron Bobier is going to be licking his wounds and back in action tomorrow. We can't wait to check that out with you. We'll see you then. Hey, PJ! Good fucking ride, man. I thought we had something for you today. Great ride. What happened to Cam?